Okay, so we continue and go a little bit more into detail. So what more exactly ethical challenges are, are, are we facing here in this area? I gave some examples, but if you go more into detail, what values are in potential conflict? Well, <clears throat> one class of things that we, we plan to do when we do antibiotic stewardship, for example, or when we try to have surveillance to have a good picture of how much antibiotic resistance we have, is that we coerce individuals in various ways. So if you've been abroad, for example, in Sweden on a holiday uh, within a certain time frame, uh, if you go to a hospital in Sweden, you will have to tell them and you will be put on a watch list especially if you've been to particular countries rather than others, and even more so if you have been treated for an infection in that country. Uh, so the, and this you have to do in order to enter the hospital. You have no choice as an individual. And this is a part of you know, controlling the problem of resistant infection. Another thing, what happens then if you discover to have a multidrug resistant infection? Well, since we can't treat it, it becomes a major infectious disease threat. You have to be isolated. And because we can't treat you with medicines, the only thing we can do is to support your life functions and hope that your body will heal in the meantime. Uh, and this might take a very long time. And in the meantime, you have to be isolated from other people in order to uh, prevent epidemics of this thing. So you can immediately see that there, this is going to look as problematic from the person who's subjected to this. And we also know from studies that people who have um, multidrug resistance infections are also seen in a worse way and actually also there are bad attitudes towards them in society because they are viewed as threats. So these people are being harmed by our measures to contain the infection. And this is well known from infectious disease management in other areas as well. We have the political actions, for example, then. So maybe we want to uh, tax antibiotics in various ways or certain products where antibiotics is used. Meat tax, for instance. So the global production of meat uses a lot of antibiotics. Or we could tax antibiotics themselves in order to take down the unnecessary use. So that's a proven way of trying to get an economic incentive to have people change, right? But of course, this will mean that someone will have to pay this economic price. Uh, or we have rules that say, well, hey, you can't really market this antibiotic unless you have proven that it's been produced in an environmental good way, for instance. Well, okay, that restricts immediately the freedom of certain stakeholders in this area. Uh, <clears throat> It's also the fact we want to get the new drugs going, right? So we need to invest a lot in this research that we've seen in other parts of this course. But as we've also seen in this part, this research is very uncertain. It's, it's very risky to invest in a, in a possible target for a new antibiotic. Po very probably it won't be something that you can use. Uh, so it takes a long time and lots of researchers. So it's a risky investment. We could have used these resources in other ways. Another way that's been contemplated is that, okay, so as we also see, so when we develop a new antibiotic, it's, it's also always a potent risk that this antibiotic is too dangerous for human beings. It needs to be dangerous to the bacteria, but if it's dangerous to bacteria, it's potentially also dangerous to the human being. And it's the question of dosage, uh, of how much you take and how often and so on. And in order to fine tune that, you do research on animals, but also on human beings. And one way to speed up the development is, of course, to accept more risk in this research uh, and have more risky projects to test new drugs in order to speed up the whole innovation process. And there, of course, you will have price paid by those people who participate in the research and are harmed by side effects that were not anticipated. And then, of course, <clears throat> In a global response to this problem, uh, you will have to ask yourself, OK, so when you have the situation like you have in some countries in sub-Saharan Africa, then that you basically need antibiotics to have children live. 
uh, you have nothing else. So should they then pay the price for this burden of a global overuse of antibiotics? Or should the price be paid somewhere else? Or should they pay the price, but we help them to handle the problem in another way, which means that we participate in paying the price for the problem. So you get the question of how to distribute the burdens, the price of handling this problem also. And all of these questions then, you can link to very general classical, ethical and political sort of value dimensions. So the first thing you have, how much should we respect the integrity and the sort of the autonomy of people that are potentially a threat uh, through spreading uh, multi-resistant bacteria? How much should we be prepared to restrict the freedom of people and of business in order to handle the problem with overuse and so on? How much should we be prepared to take risks in order to get a good thing at the other end? So that's the idea of how many eggs to break in order to get the omelet. It's a classic question in all moral philosophy. And what does it mean to act responsibly, to have a responsible way of handling the unknowns and the risks of developing new drugs? in the face of this problem. And also then, last but not least, the question of justice, of how to allocate both uh, the good things and the bad things of handling this problem well. So that's one part then, but there's also another layer to ethics in this particular area, and that's the layer that when you look at the stakeholders, the actors that can participate or not participate in actions in this area, <clears throat> they come from very different parts of society and of the world. So I will also always mention different parts of the world, but you also have, for example, different professional rules. So as a doctor, for instance, you have a very different professional role than if you are a research scientist. So a doctor is part of the job that you take on a responsibility for a particular human being that is your patient. And here comes the research scientist and says, well, hey, I want to experiment in your, on your patient in order to get these new antibiotics that could benefit not your patient, really, but these other patients in the future. So this is already part of sort of medical research ethic, but here it becomes more drastic in face of the potential threat of the antibiotic resistance, but also in, fa in face of this that's speeding up these trials and taking more risk could actually help to have a faster drug development. And that's just one example. Another example is how individual people think. So you think about your own situation as a human being in your social context. So someone comes and asks you, OK, I want you to take sick leave for another week in order not to take an antibiotic. But for you, that may mean that you lose your job. You have a temporary employment. And they, so you work at, at whatever kind of thing, temporary job, the gig economy and so on, and they won't call you anymore because they don't think you can trust you because you're on sick leave all the time. So this is a reality for a lot of people nowadays, and more and more people, even in rich countries like war. Can, it, can you say that it's rational for such a person to accept the word from the doctor that will now get a prescription? Or can you anticipate that this person would rather maybe go online than find antibiotic in some other way that's not really allowed, for instance? Well, then you have not solved the problem. So you have, so besides conflicting values and balancing those, you also need to handle the fact that different parties will assess this uh, uh, values from different positions and in different roles. So as a, as a private person, so I'm a researcher in this area, so, and then I'm thinking with one hat on, I'm also a parent with a daughter that's sometimes sick. And when I think about that, I think with a completely different hat on and different priorities. And I think most people 
are like this, and you can recognize that these things can come into conflict. So those conflicts also need to be handled in a good uh, solution to the problem. Right, so I stop there. So now we're going into a little more detail about the ethical tensions uh, in various dimensions. So if someone has any question here. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking, I was thinking about this famous case of typhoid Mary. I don't know if you know anything about this. This is a woman in the 1940s, 50s, who had a chronic infection with uh, typhoid, but she wasn't sick. But she was a cook, and she worked in private houses, and she basically made everyone else sick. And they tried to get her to stop doing that, and they eventually locked her up. I mean, they just put her on an island outside New York yes. and left her there the rest of her life. Yes. Even though she was not actually sick. Yes. Is, is I assume this is the sort of thing you're talking about. So this this is this is an extreme uh, uh, variant of a very common type of tension that you find in, in infectious disease management. Actually, that's often in infectious disease work, like in a vaccine program or, or when you try to handle an epidemic, you're dealing with something on the population level. And the important thing is not to save every individual. What you, need, what you want to accomplish is a collective effect. So in the vaccination, you want to have enough people take the vaccine in order to have this immunity that protects everybody. Uh, when the handling the, the epidemic, you need to contain enough people that are infected in order to stop not every disease instance, but to stop the spread. So that's what you want to do uh, in order, because the problem is here is on a massive scale. It's not only an individual problem. But I want to take a connecting example here. So take this example. Uh, once again, the private person, right? Uh, and so you come to the hospital, you have a, some kind of problem, and you've been on holidays. And they're asking you to fill out this form, which is this screening that you do already now in Sweden and in Holland and a lot of countries to see whether or not you're a high risk sort of for multi drug resistant infection. And as it happens, you took a holiday abroad quite recently, and as it happens, you hit your toe on a rock and you had that attended to in a care center, local care center. And truthful as you are, you report this on the form. This means that if you come in ill at this hospital, you will be subjected to all of these precautionary measures to protect not you, but other people. Uh, and these measures will not be very nice for you at all. And they will have new, no therapeutic value for yourself. And the backside of that is, of course, that when, okay, so you could say that, well, all right, the eggs and the omelette, once again, in order to, to you know, to, to keep your teeth healthy, you need to take some suffering at the dentist. It's the same kind of thing here. Uh, but what happens when this gets widely known? Of course, people will start to avoid, be likely, more likely to avoid contact with hospitals. Because they, want, they would prefer to go on holidays, but they won't like to run the risk. Or they will lie when they fill out the forms. Which completely undermines, of course, your policy aid. Once again, so this is a good illustration how the perspective is really important when you think about how to design interventions in this area to really get the result that you're after. At the, in the same way, right? So if we deny people prescriptions for antibiotics, but they go online and find the antibiotics in another way, actually the problem might be even worse because the antibiotics they get online is much more unsafe and uncertain and might end up having even more antibiotic residue in the environment, for instance, as, as a side effect. So it's a really complex when you start to think about this tension and it affects how effective 
different interventions will be because values and the way that we balance values is an important part on how we decide to do and how we decide to live. So ethics is not only an abstract thing here, it's a concrete factor that actually influences how we can expect policies to work. 